Uh, this morning we're thinking a bit about relationships and of course relationships really, really matter. Uh, family relationships matter. I know a number of us with school-aged children have loved being able to see grandparents this half term. Uh, friendships, they matter too, don't they? We all need people who we can laugh or cry with. Uh, and indeed relationships with other people at church matter. They, they provide that valuable support that we need as we live out our faith, perhaps particularly when uh, that faith runs counter to the prevailing culture. Uh, relationships, they're really important. They really matter, but they can go wrong. Uh, so I know that some of us have really difficult relationships with our families that cause lots of pain. Uh, I know that friends uh, fall out. And I know that at church things can be difficult because what unites us is Jesus Christ and our faith in him. And uh, that means we all come with our different personalities and our different preferences and our different politics. And well, all those things can sometimes rub up together and there can be uh, friction and things can not be as easy as they might be. Jesus, he has lots to say about the blessings of uh, relationships, of good relationships. But in this bit of the Sermon on the Mount we're looking at, today he he focuses in on a couple of ways that relationships can go wrong Uh, or perhaps if we want to think about it a bit more positively he shows us how two ways we can stop uh, relationships going wrong but before we uh, dive in as we carry on our series in the sermon on the mount let me remind you where we are in Matthew's gospel Uh, in this sermon Jesus he's primarily speaking to his followers, his um, disciples, as they're often called in the accounts of Jesus' life, uh, but who here in the Sermon on the Mount, they're, they're spoken of more as citizens of a different kingdom, of the kingdom of heaven. I guess they're people who we today might describe as the church. That's who he's speaking to. But that, that's not to say if you're here this morning and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, there's nothing here for you, because we know that although the disciples were Jesus' primary audience, uh, there was sort of a group of interested onlookers gathered around, uh, those who were welcomed by Jesus to hear more about what his kingdom is like. They they were welcomed by him, and and so of course if you're here this morning doing that same thing, wondering what life in Jesus' kingdom uh, is like, you too are welcomed uh, by him. And I, I think the reason he'd drawn that crowd of onlookers was because of the kingdom he was speaking about. Um, showing his followers and those listening in the good life that he calls them to, that he helps them to live out. And if you've been with us over the past few months as we've worked through the Sermon on the Mount, you will know that the life Jesus describes is beautifully appealing and it runs counter to so much of what we see uh, in the world. And so you can understand why people are gathered around but if you've been with us you'll also know that what Jesus is describing it's not like the entry requirement into the kingdom of heaven it's not like you have to do all these things to become a citizen. Now that he spoke about just before the sermon on the mount began when he called his followers to uh, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And he was able to say that the kingdom of heaven had come near because Jesus, the king of that kingdom, had entered into history and he was walking on the face of the earth. And the king came and he called us to repent. Uh, uh, It's a Bible word. It it means to recognise we're not natives of the kingdom. Because actually, if we did try and meet those kingdom standards, we'd always fall short. But when the king came, he showed us something different because, well, Jesus did live the perfect life. And so he says, if we repent, if we turn from, um, I guess, being our own king to having him as king, And as we do that, if we trust that he lived the life that we could not live and he died the death we deserve to die, well, he says we can be brought in to his kingdom as adopted uh, citizens. 
And wonderfully, Jesus, he comes to meet us where we're at. Uh, But he doesn't leave us there. And actually, he is the one who enables us to live the way of his kingdom, uh, including what we're thinking about this morning, relating well uh, to others. So as he turns to think about how we might do that, here's the first thing he has to say to his followers. Uh, He says, don't be overcritical of others uh, within the church. Have a look at verse uh, one where Jesus says, do not judge, or you too will be judged. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. And as Jesus speaks of judgment, it's got that sense of sort of looking down on another, having a sort of superior attitude over them. It's sort of uh, criticising or condemning without any concern Uh, for the one you're speaking of. And so when Jesus says, do not judge, he's not sort of ruling out any sort of discernment. Uh, Rather, he's saying, don't be superior, don't be hypocritical in your judgment uh, of others. And he's so down on this sort of judgment because, well, it's bad for us if we judge people like that. And it actually, it's bad for others within the church as well and that's what he goes on to speak of in the next couple of verses first he speaks of why it's bad for us verse two in fact let me read verse one again do not judge or you too will be judged for in the same way as you judge others you'll be judged and with the measure you use it will be measured to you jesus he he exposes the critical, condemnatory judgment we so easily fall into as we try and get something over on someone else to sort of, I don't know, profit from their struggles. And he says it's a bit like the dodgy market trader, Uh, the market trader who sort of shaves a bit off the weights they use to weigh out the products they're going to sell you or, or just cuts the rim off the scoop they use to dole out the grain so that you think you might be getting a kilogram of this or a litre of that. Whereas in fact, you're getting that bit less. You're getting the 900 grams and the traders keeping uh, the little bit extra. And Jesus says that, that when Christians judge others in the church with a sort of hypocrisy, elevating themselves above and at the expense of others, they're like that market trader skimming a bit off the edge. And he says it won't end well for them because they'll get exactly the same back from God. With the measure you use, Jesus says, it will be measured to you. Uh, If you judge others without mercy, Jesus says, then you'll be judged without mercy by the one who matters the most, by God himself. And that will happen because it will show that you've not truly repented, that you've not turned from being your own king to having Jesus as king. Jesus says it won't end well for you if you're judgmental, overcritical of those uh, in the family of the church. It's bad for you, but it's also bad for the family within the church because verse 3 Have a look. Uh, Why do you look, Jesus says, at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eyes and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, uh, let me take the speck out of your own eye, when all the time there's a plank in your eye? You hypocrite. Ah, you hypocrite. Now, I had a lot of fun earlier in the week uh, imagining the sort of slapstick Mr. Bean telling of this story. And in fact, I had so much fun that Edmund's going to come and help me out. I couldn't find a plank, but I've got my trusty cardboard tube. And you can sort of imagine Mr. Bean, can't you? Oh, I think you've got yeah. a speck in your oh. eye. Oh, there's definitely something there. Let sure? me, yeah, oh. I can, if you just, hang on, I can get it out if I just come in. No, oh, stop it. Stop it, Dave. <laughs> 
It wasn't just an excuse to beat Edmund up, I, I promise. Um, Jesus, when he tells this story, he, he, he sort of may, he, he means to make us uh, laugh. Uh, but as is so often the case, uh, humor it, it exposes us, doesn't it? And it, it cuts to our half, and we, we find ourselves laughing, and then we go, ooh. Because actually, the, the hypocrisy of pretending you don't have any faults, that you don't have that plank in your eyes, you sort of try and help others. It's incredibly damaging because it hurts them and it, and it erodes trust and it divides communities and it, it means we sort of all start putting up barriers to protect ourselves. And while that's sort of understandable, it, it, it cuts us off from the help that we can be to one another because we're always being defensive and we keep people at arm's length. Don't be overcritical of others within the church, Jesus says, because it can do so much damage. But have a look, verse 5, because Jesus, he doesn't stop there, he goes on. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother or your sister's eye. You see, Jesus, he, he doesn't say, oh, well, we all have our faults and there's a danger that we'll hurt one another if we try and help one another, so let's just not bother. No, he doesn't say that, does he? He says, sort yourself out and then you can help others. Because uh, if being over-judgmental is the danger at one end of the spectrum, then, then being entirely indifferent to the struggles of others is the danger at the other end. And so instead, Jesus says, seek the help that you need from him to take the plank uh, out of your own eye. And then you'll be able to see clearly the help that others need. Then you'll be able to point others to him, to receive from him the help that you have found that he gives. Because that speck in the eye, it still matters. You'll know if you've got a bit of dust in your eye, it's really... Annoying, it, it, it gets in the way. And so it is with those metaphorical specks Jesus speaks of here. It's no good for a brother or a sister to have one in their eye. And so if you can help that brother or sister out without metaphorically whacking them over the head with the plank in your own eye, uh, you'll be a real blessing to them. Uh, Jesus, he says, uh, in your relationships with one another uh, within the church. Don't be overcritical, but rather judge with mercy, move towards them and help. Deal with your own problems. Get their help to deal with your own problems that you might help them. Don't be overcritical of others within the church. And then verse six, there's something of a, a gear change. As Jesus says, something quite different uh, to his followers. And he moves from saying, don't be over critical to don't be under discerning. And this time he moves his gaze from within the church to outside the church. Have a look at verse six uh, with me. Jesus says, do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Now, when you uh, hear Jesus speak of dogs here, don't think of the Johnson's lovely little uh, Bella, beautifully cute uh, dog. Think more of a pack of wild dogs uh, on the hunt. And, and when you hear him speak of pigs, don't think of the film uh, Babe from the, the 90s. Rather, uh, think of a wild boar uh, hungrily foraging uh, for food. And in fact, when you hear Jesus speak about pearls, which were the most valuable commodity of his day, don't think literally, because uh, in Jesus' teaching, uh, the pearl is often uh, a metaphorical description for the most precious of things. Um, the, the good news about him, that he came to earth to save us, to bring us in to the kingdom 
of heaven by living that life we could not live and dying that death we deserve to die. When you read pearls, think of the good news about Jesus Christ. But then once you've put all those pieces in place, you sort of realize that what Jesus is saying is quite shocking. It might be something we find hard to hear because as he speaks to his followers, he says, don't waste your efforts sharing the good news about me with those who resolutely (coughs) reject it. Don't cast your pearls, uh, throw your pearls to pigs. And as we sort of process this hard instruction of Jesus's, I think think it's worth saying it's not one to be hasty with. Uh, I'm incredibly grateful that my Christian friends and I was at uni, continued to talk to me about Jesus when I wasn't trusting him uh, for three years as I sort of journeyed towards faith. Uh, I'm so grateful they didn't uh, throw their pearls elsewhere, uh, as it were. And if you're here this morning because you've been brought along by a Christian uh, friend, even though you perhaps wouldn't call yourself a Christian, please don't hear Jesus saying to that friend, oh, you've just got to wash your hands of them, because that's not what he's saying. Uh, Rather, Jesus would want them to help you appreciate the pearls that are good news, uh, the good news about faith in him, and and to help you see how they're not just good news for your friends, but good news for you. And one resource uh, you might want to grab hold of, we find really helpful in doing that, it's just a short little booklet we have called uh, A Better Life, and it's got four short passages from one of the other gospel accounts of Jesus' life from John's gospel. And each uh, passage just has three little questions to help you understand that passage, but also to understand the Christian faith. And uh, if you wanted, you could take a copy of this away. There's plenty of copies on the welcome table uh, at the back and read through it for yourself. But really, it it works best as a a conversation starter. Uh, So why not ask that Christian friend to have a coffee to chat through it uh, with you. And I know they'd be delighted uh, to do that. Okay. Well, although none of us, none of you, are the people Jesus is warning his disciples about, he nevertheless is warning that there are some people that they should sort of steer clear of as they look to share their faith with others. And actually, the reason for that is... Just the same as the first uh, thing, that they're not to be overcritical of others within the church because there are some bad consequences for the Christian when they do that. And actually, there are bad consequences for others as well. Uh, For the Christian, there's the the hurt and the pain and the suffering of rejection as the pearls are trampled underfoot. And there's the, the, the physical threat of persecution. Strong words, isn't it? Uh, they, the dogs will turn and tear you to pieces, whether that's literally or metaphorically. And Jesus, he doesn't want his people to bring that unnecessary suffering upon themselves. It's bad for them. And although Jesus doesn't say so explicitly, uh, it's also bad for others outside of the church because if a Christian has a really, really bruising experience like this, then they might think twice about speaking of Jesus to someone again. And that second person, well, they might be really receptive to the good news about Jesus, but because the Christian has put their guard up and is on the defensive, they don't want to go there. And so that person doesn't get to hear. And so Jesus says to his followers, don't be under discerning uh, of those outside the church. And of course, none of this is easy uh, to do. Knowing when you have a plank in your eye is hard because you can't see it. Your vision's blocked. Uh, Knowing, discerning when someone is so hostile to Jesus and the good news about him that they'll sort of trample it underfoot and hurt you 
in the process. That's really hard to work out, particularly when the good news about Jesus is so foreign to so many uh, today. Which is why at the end of our passage, Jesus turns to tell us what we can do to get the help we need to navigate uh, these situations. And he tells his followers to pray. Have a look, verse 7. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. If knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Jesus says, do you need help working out what to do, working out where the plank is, working out who to speak to? Then ask and seek and knock. Uh, There's nothing complicated about it, Jesus says. There's no need for fancy, elaborate prayers. And actually, prayer, it's wonderfully inclusive. Beginning of verse 8, everyone who asks, receives. Jesus says you, you don't need to be someone special in the kingdom to have access to the king. Everyone who asks, receives. It's for all God's people. But the real emphasis of these verses is not Uh, the simplicity of prayer or the inclusivity of prayer, but rather how willing God is to answer prayer for the sort of wisdom we need to see those planks and discern who to speak to. Have a look, verse 8 again. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Uh, There's no reluctance on God's part to hear these prayers and and knowing that God will answer those prayers I don't know about you but I find that wonderfully encouraging to keep asking him keep seeking him keep knocking for him to get that wisdom that I need but it might be that you still need persuading that this is what God is like so Jesus continues verse 9 Uh, Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? Uh, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Now, if anyone's wondering, I don't think any child would fall for such an obvious bait and switch. In, in Jesus' day, um, the sort of sto- uh, uh, sorry, not the stones, the bread that they would have had would have looked a bit like a bigger version of this pebble. And so if you had a bigger version of this pebble on your plate, you wouldn't quite be able to tell it apart from the sort of loaves that you'd be used to. And the sort of fish Jesus is speaking of, it's sort of an eel-like fish. I couldn't find any eels in the Thames this morning to show you, but <laughs> you could imagine how a sort of eel-like fish wouldn't look too dissimilar uh, from a snake. And here's the point of what Jesus is saying. He's saying not even the most practical joke-loving parent would ever try such a switch. They wouldn't pull this sort of stunt on their kids. No one wants to see their child bite into a rock. Uh, No one wants to see their child get bitten by a snake. And so he goes on to say, and again, some words that are hard for us to hear, to comprehend. Uh, If you, though you are evil, and uh, by that Jesus doesn't mean what our minds go to when we hear that word, evil, but but more that we're not natural-born citizens of the kingdom he's been speaking so much about. If people like us know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more, Jesus says, will your Father in heaven, the most natural citizen of that kingdom, give good gifts to those who ask him? of course he will answer those prayers for wisdom Uh, Jesus says you don't need to worry that he's going to trick you 
uh, that he's going to point out something in your life that wouldn't be better to be rid of, that he's going to lead you into a conversation that's going to be damaging to you. He gives good gifts to those uh, who ask him. He'll give us that wisdom. And when we receive that wisdom from God, we'll be able to do what Jesus speaks of in verse 12, where he says, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. So this sums up the law and the prophets. When God answers your prayers for wisdom, Jesus says you'll be able to judge others with mercy in a way that's helpful, not hypocritical. And when God answers your prayers for wisdom, Jesus says you'll have discernment in sharing the good news about him with others. And you'll know that you'll, you'll sort of be able to work out when they're interested, when they want to hear it. And for those who don't, well, actually, you won't give them what they don't want, however tragic that might be for them. When, with God's help, Jesus says, we are able to do to others what you would have them do to you. Uh, and that, of course, is exactly what Jesus himself did, isn't it? Uh, he, he didn't do what we find it so tempting to do, uh, which is to do to others what they've done to us, particularly when they've mistreated us. It's so easy, uh, isn't it, to just in little ways try and get back at them. And yet Jesus wasn't like that at all. He, he, he didn't return the ambivalence he so often received with people, uh, from people by being disinterested in them. Uh, or at the worst end of the spectrum, he, he didn't return the hatred he received with others for hatred for them, for those he came to save now, instead, he, he gave the people, he gave us what we most needed as he lived the life we cannot live and died the death we deserve to die. He, he, he did unto us what he wished we'd do unto him, but didn't. And it's when our experience of that and when our appreciation of that and, and when we join the dots that Jesus actually was only able to do all that with his heavenly Father's help. When we put all that together, that, that becomes the fuel that we need to live this out, to do to others what you would have them do to you. Because actually, if you've ever tried to do it in your own strength, it's, it's not something that we can do. And so as we think about doing that and as we think about relating well to others and as we think about relating well to those outside the church. Let me do what Jesus uh, encourages us to do, ask and seek and knock. Let me lead us in a prayer as this part of our time together comes uh, to a close. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you uh, put us in relationships, that uh, this life is not one that we have to live uh, on our own. We, we thank you for families, we thank you for friends, we thank you for our church family and we pray that all those relationships would be a wonderful blessing to us and that where there has been hurt and where there has been mistreatment you would bring comfort and that you would bring uh, healing. And we pray as Jesus tells us to um, that you would give us the wisdom we need to relate well to others. Please help us to um, see the plank in our own eye, that, that we might go to Jesus to get the help we need to deal with that and then be in a place to help others within our church family. Protect us from that hypocritical, um, condemnatory judgment that Jesus speaks against. Prevent us from hurting uh, one another, we pray. 
And Father, we ask too that uh, you would um, make those we come into contact with outside of the church really open and really receptive to that most precious of things, to that pearl of great price, to the good news about Jesus Christ. We, we ask that you'd spare us uh, from the difficulty Jesus speaks of in verse 6, where actually his people have to step back and um, not speak of him, because we, we don't want to do that, Lord. We want many to come uh, to know him, and so we pray that you might protect us uh, from that. But if there are situations where speaking of Jesus is overly provocative, uh, give us the wisdom and discernment we need to know when uh, to stop, we pray. And would you please uh, help us, not just to pray now, but to keep praying, to ask and to seek uh, and to knock, knowing that you love to hear your people's prayers, knowing that you want to give us the wisdom uh, that we need. Help us to, um, to pray that we might be in a place to uh, do to others as we'd have them do uh, to us. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>